We just got the grand, I wouldn't say the grand tour, we got the grand exterior tour. Yeah, kind of like uh, the iceberg. We got the tip of the iceberg there. Yep. We got a point. See that all that over there? Yeah. So, um, first off, just thanks for having us out here. Really appreciate thanks, it. It was thanks fun. For coming. Um, when we recorded the first time, I had a record amount of, you got to get Skip back on. Oh, goodness. A lot. So, not that there's any high uh, anticipation or expectations, but um, for anyone that did not catch the first one, I encourage them to go listen to it. But take a chance just to introduce yourself however you'd like. Um, so, yeah, I'm Skip Sly. Uh, I've lived in Iowa for about 20 years. Uh, grew up in Michigan. I would say I was a, a city boy that always had a passion for the outdoors. Um, self-taught hunter. Just always had a fire for it. I've just always loved it. And we were talking a little bit ago, just growing up where there was no deer. I mean, I'd go out and freeze for a day and not see a deer, and I'd come back the next day and do it again, and I kept wanting to do that. Um, so I got to see maybe the worst hunting. I really believe it's some of the worst hunting in the country uh, where I grew up. I mean, just awful. And somehow I still got uh, captured and just captivated by hunting and wanting to be outdoors. and. And then going from the worst hunting to a little bit better, to a little bit better, to a little bit better after years and years and years and a lot of work. And then finally going to other states where my eyes were just open, like, oh my goodness, I had no idea hunting could be uh, like it is here. I mean, the people I grew up with in Michigan that never got to experience those other areas, they didn't, nobody back home, even to this day, probably a lot of these guys don't realize how good some of these other states are and areas are or how bad they have it. You know, they're kind of, that's all they've known. And that was all I knew, I knew for a long time too. So, you know, for me to go from maybe the worst hunting in the country and some of the worst overrun, um, ground with just I mean, seeing hunters all over the place and no deer, um, coming to good spots just made me appreciate it a lot more. And it just made me want to keep learning and getting into better areas and better and better and better. But, but it also gave me maybe some education to understand, Hey, I know what it's like at the bottom. I know what it's like the worst at, at the worst. And I know what it's like at the best now. And I know what it's like all in between. And, you know, thankfully I got to hunt in all different States, Nebraska, Kansas, um, Missouri, Iowa, Illinois. Uh, I've been all over the place. I've been in Northern Michigan. I've been in the UP where there's a, some wolves, a few deer, uh, very few deer. And then I got to hunt the farm belt in Southern Michigan, which for Michigan would be considered pretty good, but still pretty, uh, pretty poor overall. I mean, definitely, definitely better than, uh, some other areas, but yeah. And then, and then being out to Iowa and even, even within Iowa, there's areas that are fantastic. There's areas that are mediocre and there's areas that, I mean, over hunted, very, not, not very many mature deer, um, very difficult hunting situations. I mean, I think that's, that's common for every state though. You know, you got your good pockets, you've got good situations, you might be in a good neighborhood or you might be in a really bad neighborhood. So Iowa's got the spectrum as well. But overall, I mean, clearly Iowa is just light years, light years different than Michigan and probably, um, not probably, but it's even light years ahead of, of the surrounding states. I mean, you go across those magic lines and it's significantly worse in every direction. You go across that line, the hunting changes. So Iowa's got something special and that's, that would be regulations. So, all right, well, that was one of the questions I had later on, but I'll just ask it right now. Sure. I say you have to sell this farm, and you have to go to a different state to start over. Where are you going? Um, probably Kansas. I'd say I'd go to Kansas. Just um, So, traveling around the country, um, Kansas was probably the, the other place I really, really loved. I, I liked Illinois. It was too commercialized. It went down the tubes too. I, I saw... Illinois go down, go down the tubes too quickly. Now, I know Kansas has had some problems, too, with commercialization, but there's still some areas in Kansas that, I mean, when you get out to some parts of the country where people are like, you, you're you coming out here to deer hunt with a bow, and they're kind of surprised at that. I like going to those areas, and Kansas is still vast enough where I think there's still a lot of opportunity. Um, it's, it's certainly publicized, but it's still mm -hmm. vast enough where, uh, you know, deer can reach maturity. Um, you could buy, you can buy good sized farms. You could make them a lot better. There's a lot of room for deer management. Um, you know, a lot of the opportunities in, 
in some of the, you know, like Illinois, just the chance to, to buy a great big farm in Illinois is, is so difficult where in Kansas it's not. So I'd say I go to Kansas, um, you know, I, and then my other fascinations may be to go, go hunt in like Canada, like Alberta, Saskatchewan, but that's kind of on like a bucket list, just a to do thing, just getting mm-hmm. in the middle of nowhere. And, um, but I know they've had their challenges too with, uh, more pressure. And I've talked to some people that have gone there and like, they're actually, they shoot a lot of the good three and four year olds and, or the winters are really tough or the wolves are really tough. So I, I don't think you can go anywhere mm-hmm. and say, Hey, I'm going to hunt this area and it's going to be this magic situation. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. I don't care if it's Canada. I don't care if it's a certain state, but yeah, if I, if I got removed from Iowa, I'd probably go to probably to Kansas and then next on that list would maybe be Ohio and that's more of a gut thing just because I like the regulations and they're right in that good nutrition belt good farm ground mixed with with timber and then you can get in some of the the mountain settings where it's pretty vast but I think you, you know you get too far north and you get into lack of nutrition you get into wolves you get into harsh winters and you got this belt through the midwest it's kind of the the mecca of nutrition mixed with cover and you know, it, it could be Indiana, it could be Illinois, it could be Nebraska, it could be Missouri. It's just the the, re- the regulations in those states hinder them. I mean, some are better better than others, um, but I mean, we're not too far from Missouri, and whew, drops down pretty hard into Missouri. And there's more cover over there, and there's probably less people on the in the North Belt of Missouri. It's very sparsely populated, but the rifles in the middle of the rut. There's no way I. I couldn't go to Missouri and I'd be too frustrated. So what if, what if Iowa changed their regulations to where they're like, all right, let's change our shotgun season to the first, the second and third week in November. Then the last great whitetail state is toast. It's done. That's the sad thing about it's it. A, though. It's a sad thing. Yeah. It's, and that's why I hope it doesn't happen. Um, if they do that, it's toast. Uh, we'd, we'd be done. I mean, this state is seven to eight percent timber. There's very little timber in this state. So it's all on the southern belt, the eastern belt, the western belt, the whole central part of the state all the way up, all the way up. And, and then when you hit Minnesota and you hit Wisconsin across the river, then the habitat starts again in the northeast Kansas. But there's only 7 to 8% timber here. So there's not very much timber. And, and we're only a couple regulation choices away from the system that we have now really going down. So, um, I mean... The, the people, the hunters of, of Iowa have done a pretty good job of fighting this stuff off. We need to do a better job. We're on defense. Um, we probably need to go on offense, but yeah, we're a couple regulation choices, uh, and changes away from this, this state going down. And I, and I'm, I'm definitely an optimistic person. I'm not Debbie Downer, but I see the threats. I mean, I've watched it happen in other states. So Iowa's a very fragile state. Now, if you said, Hey, Iowa is uh 75% timber and there's hardly any people here. Hardly, very few hunters. Okay, we can get away with a lot, but that's not the case. There's a ton of hunters here. People think Iowa is all the rural, just no hunters. There's hunters all over here. You can't go on a piece of ground without seeing tons of tree stands, tons of blinds, tons of hunting signs. Getting permissions hard. There's tons of people here, and it's still good, and it's good because of the regulations. And the sad part or the opportunity is if these other states could, it'll never happen. And I hear this all the time, but if, if just a couple of them could get their act together, they could, they could be far better than Iowa, Minnesota could, or Missouri with two or three times the habitat could put Iowa to shame if they could just move that rifle season out of the rut. I mean, it'd blow Iowa out of the water. Just the rifle season change. Do you think? Just that one. That's the main one. Yeah. So if you could say, Hey, magically let's change one regulation in missouri if you could move that gun season back two weeks that state would blow up it'd be more opportunities for everybody Mm -hmm. the hunting would would destroy iowa um and yeah missouri missouri's cover just right down the road here is is incredible the mix with ag and timber but you know like my neighbors up here um i've got a non i've got some non-residents maybe no i've got so we've got some neighbors over here um, that'll bounce around to different states. And I mean, I know some that are like, Hey, in Iowa, here's my standard. You know, I'll shoot a five or a six year old deer. If I go to Missouri, I'll shoot a three year old deer. Um, their standards just change. They understand that, um, the, the results are going to be vastly different and the management's just, I mean, and it's just going across a magic line. So for our Illinois, for example, 
well, what's the magic reg- regulation you changed there? <sighs> so Illinois, um, I, I like the short gun season. Uh, if they could, if they could move it back just a little bit, it would be, it would be vastly, it would help a lot. And if they could deal, if if they could um, dial down the the non-resident presidents in Illinois, it would help drastically because it's just created a culture that um, it's all pay to play, it's all leased up, uh, and it's all these guys that that go there for a week or two weeks or whatever. That hey, if I see a three year old buck with kickers, I'm going to shoot it. You know, I paid a lot for this buck tag. I got two weeks to hunt. Uh, I paid thirty dollars for my lease or or this outfitting cost, so all that non-resident pressure has really hurt Illinois, in my opinion. Uh, everything when I when I went there and I spent a lot of years going there um, was really it got leased up. I mean, like everything was leased up by the time I quit going there. So if there was a way to reduce the non-residents, like they do in Iowa, they limit it. it the draw gets longer and it's a difficult situation, but. Um, but the residents in Iowa have the priority, you know, and that's how it should be. The residents of Illinois should have the priority and should have the advantages. But a lot of times they can't compete with the non-residents and the non-residents lock things up. And, you know, ground becomes so expensive or tough to lease that more guys got to go in on leases or or the ground gets segmented up. And the first three-year-old with kickers and, and splits that comes by gets shot and and it's just a downward spiral. These bucks are not able to get to maturity. Whatever their scores, they're just not able to get to maturity as often as states like Iowa. Um, so Illinois, I would say if they reduce their non-resident, um, the amount of tags they could get, which they used to do that back in the day, and I don't know the, the current status. It's pretty much over the okay. counter now. Yeah. Over the counter. Okay. It isn't, but it is. Yeah, I get it. I get it. So if they reduce that, if they move their gun season back, which I think that's minor, um, but if they move their gun season back, it sure would help. And is it one or two bucks? Two bucks state. Two bucks. If they if they made it a one buck state, so uh, reduce the non residents, <laughs> maybe move the gun season back. Gun season that's minor. Yeah. And make it a one buck state. Illinois would be rocking again. And I, it's not to say Illinois doesn't have great bucks because they do, and they have some pockets. Sure. If you search for them, you can find giants. I mean, it's got. Illinois has the the foundation of one of the best whitetail habitat, the the best whitetail states in the country. I mean, it's got the mix with the the um, the ag and the timber. I mean, I think Illinois has three or four times the amount of cover that Iowa does. I mean, it's something like roughly. I mean, this is going back in my memory, but twenty thirty percent timber where we have seven to eight. But you guys have the fertility. You've got the same climate. I mean, we're just across the river from each other. So mm-hmm. um, Illinois could be, Illinois could destroy Iowa if the regulations got back on track. Now, um, even with the problems it has with, with the politicians that want to exploit the state for money, for the non-residents, everybody, that, it's just about money now. I just want leasing my ground as part of my, my income now. And um, getting permission on ground is long, long, that, that ship has sailed. Um, it's still a great state and it, it just, it could be so much better if uh, if somebody would um, maybe prioritize the resource over over the money, uh, tag sales, non-resident tag sales, um, in and just getting back to common sense regulations over there. I mean, it's got the potential to be the best the best deer state in the country, along with a handful of others. What are some? What about Indiana? Indiana, Indiana seems to be. They're a one, but one buck state. <laughs> okay, bing, bingo, right there. <laughs> why? Why is Indiana? All of a sudden, you're like, hey, Indiana is considerably better than Michigan. It's considerably better than what it used to be. Or, um, and a lot, and a lot of people will say Indiana is a sleeper state. Well, why is that? It's because they went to a one buck rule, and I don't know if they always have been, but the fact that they're one buck rule, it's like, whoa, they're kicking out some huge deer, and that is specifically to a one buck rule. And then you go, okay, well. Why are they kicking out such giant deer? Well, they went to one buck rule. And also, again, they have a perfect mix of agriculture with timber. And a, a vast uh, part of that state, it's just a gorgeous whitetail habitat mix. I mean, you couldn't design it Southern any better. Indiana. Yeah. So so you say, hey, they're pumping out some big deer. Well, imagine if they moved. The their, rifle season. Yeah. I mean, that state would, again, that state <laughs> would destroy Iowa. It'd destroy it. But. They can't make those. Or right now, they haven't made those changes. If they could make those choices, those those changes, yeah, 
it would destroy Iowa. Indiana has just absolute top-notch potential. Handful of states. That this whole belt of fertility, yeah. where you've got corn and soybeans mixed with with timber. Southern Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri. Um, all of them have equal potential. That's just phenomenal. And I would say you go well. Which ones have the most cover? And, and add Minnesota and Wisconsin to that. The, the southern, southern parts part. of those. And you say, well, they have considerably more good cover and mix of cover than Iowa, but they have considerably worse results. Well, that's all due to regulation. So, um, so there's probably maybe just shy of 10 states that could be just astronomically amazing for everybody, for all hunters. It'd mm-hmm. give opportunities to everybody uh, if they just made a couple common sense regulation choices and changes. Do you think anything like that is realistic? I think, probability speaking, everybody's like, listen, we're, our, our state has been like this for so long. The hunters are so stubborn that the chances are slim. But there's 10 states that probably fit this category. And you looked at a few of them, and I don't, I don't know Indiana's history if they were always one buck. But if a state makes one change like that, one of these states is going to make a change. And, and people are going to follow. Yeah, and here's why I think out of 10, you say, well, maybe eight never change a thing. Fine. But. A couple will, and here's why my gut tells me a couple will, is because 20 years ago, you had the stubborn generation that, hey, you know, we don't do this, or, you know, we don't shoot does, or we we just shoot the first buck we see. We got to have our buck pole filled with bucks. You got these hunters that are great. Well, now you have a younger generation that's coming up that gets deer management. They understand it. They want a more balanced age structure. They want to be able to hunt older bucks, more mature bucks. So the new generation, every year that goes by, this newer generation that I'm just going to say it, they, they just get it a lot better than the old school. Um, they're taking over and they're making the decision. So I would just say, statistically speaking, the fact that the younger generation is coming up through the ranks and they're going to be controlling more of the regulations and what happens. I think a couple of these states are finally going to go, let's just so, do some things that make common sense. It's going to make our state amazing. Mm-hmm. Instead of having all the people leave, to want to go to Iowa and wait five years for a tag, let's let's fix our own state. It'll happen. It'll happen in a couple states. I don't know which ones, but I think that movement is growing, and I think the un- younger generation with their education mm-hmm. uh, is going to make it happen. You know, if I had to guess, in the next five or ten years, maybe one of these states makes a common sense change that that blows their state up and maybe takes a little attention off of our state, which I would <laughs> love. I bet you would. So it looks like around two, the year 2000, they changed that. No, okay. in 2002. Okay. 2002, they changed that. This one, the stats. So says, things can change. Yeah. And so it says since the year, this was in a 2018 article. Since the year 2000, Indiana has jumped from 11th to 4th in overall typical Boone and Crockett bucks. So anybody with just a drop of common sense and a drop of education can look that up and they go, go yeah, I have heard more about Indiana. They have put out more big bucks. What's happened? Well, look, they went from two bucks to one buck. So if Indiana can make a change, why can't Minnesota make some kind of a change? Wisconsin, Missouri, uh, Michigan, you know, all these states, there's little changes they could make. I mean, um, I hear it all the time. There's always, re- oh, no, nobody will ever change. No, 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 <laughs> we'll never change. It can change. It can change. It's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying all these states are going to change overnight, but I, I would... My gut tells me that a couple of these states are going to change, and there's enough people that are just sick of seeing their state's potential just be ruined every year, just ruined. So um, I think as this this younger generation comes up, we're going to see a few states make even just a little bit of change, just like going to the one buck rule, or hey, let's move the rifle season back two weeks, just little things like that. I feel like it's would... anarchy, though, for like that crowd, like... <sighs> We've been doing hunting oh, camp for the same year. Just because it's been like this forever, so we have to keep it like this forever. There's no logic to that. No, there's, there's no not. logic. It benefits everybody. If you can have a, a better age structure across the whole herd, um, it's balanced, it's healthy, uh, it's more opportunity for everybody. It's not like it just benefits one group because a guy that wants to shoot a year and a half old buck or two and a half year old buck, he can still do that. It's just the guys that they say, hey, my passion is to try and target a little bit older buck a three-year-old a four-year-old a five-year-old whatever now they actually have an opportunity to do that mm-hmm. um so the guys that want to shoot the people that say hey i just want to shoot uh the first buck that walked by they'll always have that opportunity yeah in every state um 
And now we're just giving opportunities to people that say, no, I want, I want to shoot something a little older. This is a challenge. I want to, I want to chase a deer that actually exists, maybe a three-year-old that actually does exist because we have some sense of management. I mean, in Iowa, if your goal, I mean, it's, it's still rare here, but if your goal is to, to chase or to hunt a five-year-old deer in Iowa, you can do that here. If somebody said, hey, I want to go to Michigan and chase five-year-old deer, it's wasting your time. <laughs> You're totally wasting your time. That's funny. It's just the truth. I mean, um, you know, there's a handful of states and, you know, in those people in the minority, I'm not, I'm not saying to say, hey, we, we have to make sure our states have five-year-old deer all over the place. It's not like that. But I'm saying if, you ha- if your states are set up so that there's some deer that can slip by, so the guys that do have a passion for, for pursuing a, a mature deer or an older deer, at least they're there. And a lot of states are not, they're not there. And, you know, for some people, um, maybe you know, I, I, it's not that the, the DNR's goal is to make it fun for people necessarily. I mean, in some regards it is. But um, if, if I went and hunted Michigan right now, it wouldn't be fun for me. I mean, it'd be, I would be bored out of my mind looking at maybe, maybe getting a chance at, you know, where I grew up at it, maybe a two and a half year old deer. That's not enjoyable for me. Mm-hmm. And then I go back to some of these kids that, Hey, I, I want to get you away from looking at electronics all day from playing video games. Let's go hunt. And they go out there and don't see anything other than other hunters and, um, ground that's just gets ravaged and the regulations are horrible and they're not seeing deer. Uh, they're seeing maybe a a few little bucks. They're not, they're not enjoying that. That's not how you recruit new hunters. That's not how you compete with electronics to give these poor regulations. They has a horrible, um, a horrible age structure and and a horrible management situation for deer. That's not how you engage new hunters. So Mm -hmm. I don't think it's effective. Yeah. While we're on a controversial topics. Uh, so how about, uh, when people say, uh, they shouldn't shoot does. I think it's it's very case dependent. I mean, if you're in an area with an abundance of does, um, and what would be a way to gauge that? It's I mean, very subjective. Again, it's tough. I mean, if you, if you're having tons of car deer accidents, you're having tons of crop damage. You're going out to a field and you see um, you see forty or fifty does here, and you go to the next field and you see another forty or fifty does. Yeah, there's plenty of does to be shot, um, and you can shoot some does. If you're going out for a week and you're only seeing two or three does, you probably don't need to be shooting any does. But you know, we'll see places. I'll see p- places around here, even in Iowa, where a, there'll be farms where it's not common, but you might see fifty does, and the guy will still shoot. A, a two-year-old buck it's just like why why not shoot the doe in that situation now if you're in an area with very 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 few deer uh and you're just trying to get one for your freezer i get it you know shoot a sure. buck but um a lot of times um you know it, it makes a lot of sense to shoot a doe as opposed to shooting just another another little buck that you're just kind of look at and nail them up in your garage and you know year after you're a kid very different, very different. Whatever makes a kid happy for me, and, and granted, people can do whatever they want. I'm not telling anybody what to do. But just your opinion. Yeah, just my opinion. It's just, you know, you get a guy who, and it's usually the guys that are complaining how bad the hunting is that are shooting their, <laughs> another little buck, and yeah, the hunting kind of sucks around here. Well, there might be a reason for that. So. Yeah, I would agree. So we'll, we're going to be jumping around here just a little bit. So kind of uh, for that same disgruntled guy. What is the biggest reason mature bucks leave their farm? So in a good managed state, I would say um, there is a whole pitfall of reasons. I mean, you know, you go to your top tier reasons, you know, you're overpressuring those deer. You can't stay out of your farm. Um, and what is, a, what is a threshold so people can get an idea? Well, I'm, I'm only in there to check my cameras. Right. Yeah. So... <laughs> Like if I had an 80 acre farm and I was in there weekly or every other week, you can't do that. If I was, if I had an 80 acre farm, let's just say it was 40 acres of timber and I was in that timber 10, 20 times a year, not during hunting season, doing little projects, checking cameras. I mean, you cannot do that in my opinion. Um, you know, I, I started with an 80 acre farm and it was about half timber. I mean, I'd go in that timber after season to do a little bit of timber stand improvement, I'd hunt it lightly on the edges a couple times, pretty intrusively, uh, when it was the right wind and the right day in November, but over pressuring a farm and blowing them off your food. Uh, if you put a food plot there and you're constantly walking past it and 
that you're like, hey, every time I go to that food, there's a the guy messing with me. Uh, they're going to avoid that pretty quick. So, um, you know, a lot of people in general who have maybe just kind of a, a mild education about deer, they'll be like, well, I was back chainsawing on my farm or I was doing this or I was doing that. And I came back two hours later, there's deer there. They don't seem to mind. They don't mind this. Deer don't mind that. Yeah, does don't mind it. Young bucks don't mind it. A mature deer, very, very different. So um, people intertwine those pretty frequently. They'll be like, well, I, I don't think deer mind this activity. Yeah, and generally does and young bucks don't. But a mature deer, you have to treat them like a different animal. And if that mature deer, I don't care if it's summertime, I don't care if it's springtime, I don't care if it's you know non-hunting season or hunting season. If that mature deer is getting messed with uh, a dozen different times, he's not He's not going to tolerate it. He doesn't like it's gonna it. move. Yeah, and you might have a, a deer with a personality that's somewhat a little more used to people, and maybe you can have a, a certain personality deer that can tolerate it a little bit, but on average, most mature, mature deer, they're not going to tolerate that stuff, and they, they'll leave the farm. So let's say someone, they just they have to go out. That's their happy place. They have 80 acres. They have to go. It, maybe it's once a month or twice a month. Would you just say, all right, that's great, go do that, but leave this 20 acres alone, this 10 acres alone? Yeah, um, I would leave it alone, but so that was that was me. So I bought 80 acres, and I had to be out there all the time. Well, my solution to that was I had my 80 acres, and I made it as good as I could make it, but I also went and got permission on 10 other places around there. So if I had to go do something, I'd go to a different farm down the road, and it was a numbers game, and you know, my first 80 acre farm, we killed some nice bucks off of it, but I might have killed a buck five miles down the road this way, five miles down the road that way. And I would spread out my, my pressure. You can't just say, Hey, I have my 80 acre piece and that's all I'm going to hunt. I mean, you could do it and you might be able to kill some nice bucks that way, but I don't think it's real effective. I think you need to spread your, spread your pressure out, especially with a smaller track, like 80 acres. You got to go find some other places to hunt. Even if it's public, finding a couple good spots on public that are overlooked. So Hey, the wind not, might not be right, or hey, I've I've overpressured my eighty. I need to give it a break for a few days. And you go to these different places. You you have to have other options. Mm -hmm. So, by and large, you think that the reason mature bucks often leave your farm is pressure related. Pressure, yeah, pressure. I would say I would say that's number probably number one. Um, number one pressure. Number two is that that farm might not have uh, the habitat set up correctly. It might not be ideal for what a mature buck wants too. So, you know, if my 80 acres is a wide open piece of timber that I can see through from end to end, you know, no matter how much I pressure that, it's probably not ideal mature buck habitat too. So habitat would probably be second down in that list. Sure. And well, let's talk about that too. Cause I think, uh, but that looks pretty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It looks pretty. Um, Sure. Uh, if you want pretty, I mean, th I, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not going to be, it's not going to be ideal deer habitat. Um, mature bucks are not going to want to be there. It's nice for a nature walk, uh, which I'm not out doing nature walks at my farm. Though. That's not why I own my farms. I'm not out to do nature walks. I'm not out to have a pretty farm. Uh, I can go to the state park for that. If I want to see a pretty farm, I'll go out to the state park. We can take a walk with my family. We can make noise. We can do whatever we want. My farm is not going to be pretty as you, you guys saw earlier. I mean, it's from my perspective, it is, it's pretty in the sense of this I, is awesome. <laughs> yeah. So I think, but, yeah. I think, you know, ideal whitetail habitat is pretty. I mean, so yeah. uh, it's pretty, a different, different, uh, the different eye, taste. Yeah. The eye, whatever the eye, the beholder. I mean, um, seeing, uh, habitat with great brows, great bedding, great thermal cover, lots of diversity, lots of changes in the terrain. Um, that's pretty to me, but that's because I'm a passionate whitetail hunter and I love seeing, um, premium habitat or creating premium habitat. And maybe if I, if I buy a farm or if I bought a farm that was like a park one hour later or, or one year later, sorry, one year later, that farm is not going to look like a park. It's going to look vastly different than that. Mm -hmm. So, and so like, uh, this for general terms, so people can get a frame of reference, a 40 that's park-esque. I give you a chainsaw. Let's say first off, you you buy it. It's forty. It's park esque. Scale one to ten. What would you give that farm, excluding any outside factors of, you know, neighborhood? So on the scale spectrum. So like, if your farm is a a nine point nine yep. or a ten, yep. What would that be? Uh, like a blank forty that's wide open. Yeah. 
I mean, maybe a one or a two. Um, and realistically, I'd want to take a farm that's a one or a two. And I think within a year, you could probably make that farm a six or a seven done correctly with education and a lot of work um, and sp some specific goals in mind. You're not going to make it a 10. I, I mean, it's potential. It has potential to make that farm a 10, but to make a 40 acres go from a two to a 10 is probably going to take three or four years at least. Uh, but that's the cool part is a wide, oak, a wide open farm with very little potential as it sits can go from pretty crummy to pretty amazing in a relatively short period of time if you know what you're doing and you follow the plan correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll give you that chainsaw. Yep. You just bought this 40. It's a one or a two. All right, go have fun. And you go in and do it correct. So it's a six or a seven just that following year. Yep. And then to get it to the eight or nine in the next three years, what are you doing beyond the cuts? So I would say... When all my, my, so with the chainsaw, I want, I want to change the structure of the forest. I want to have lots of terrain changes. I want to have lots of structural changes. It's like taking a pond that you dig and it's just a blank bowl. Well, that's not very good for fish. If you add all this structure in there, it's great for fish. It's got all these different places for them to hide. Well, that's kind of the same way as what you're doing, what you're doing with your woods. You're breaking it up into all this structure. And then... What you're doing after that is you're placing food in strategic places where they're safe and it's keeping the deer safer. Maybe it's keeping them from going to a neighbor that's going to shoot every buck that's there. So all of a sudden these, these bucks are surviving that wouldn't survive before. And it's got safe food. It's got safe bedding. So the woods now has cover. It's got tons of browse. It's got more mass production. Um, the bedding has just astronomically increased instead of maybe two or three good bedding areas. Now you have on 40 acres. I mean, you could have maybe 30 good bedding areas if you're, if done correctly. Mm -hmm. So two or three good bedding areas to 30, you're going to hold a lot more deer. Way more opportunities. Way more opportunities. And then, and then just after everything is set up correctly, the food, um, the timber with the cover, the browse, the bedding, the terrain changes. Now it's just hunting it and pressuring it correctly. Mm -hmm. And, and those deer will, after a few years, really established that farm as a safe haven as, Hey, I, I like my home here. I want to stay here. I know this is my safety. Um, and a lot more deer are going to make that, that 40 acres home than the one you found it. I mean, astronomically more mm -hmm. three or four fold more in my opinion. Yeah. And I, you don't have to give numbers, but the multiple on this farm from when you bought it the first year to mature buck holding capacity is what? 10, not 10 X. Maybe less than that? Um, so I would say, the, so when I bought this farm, somebody had owned it that had said, hey, listen, you don't have to do a thing to this farm. It's done. And that was far from the case. But I would say the, the mature buck carrying capacity is maybe three or four fold increase uh, a couple years after I bought it. Maybe now it's maybe four or five increase just because I fine tuned everything. But uh, and still having mature bucks around, I mean, is still difficult in any situation, but, um, I mean, dialing in every last bit of that habitat and making use of every square inch of your ground. Yeah. I mean, I think realistically a guy could make a, a farm hold two, three, four times as many That's huge. bucks or, or mature bucks even. Mm -hmm. So, and so when you're doing that too, this is something that I, you're not planting shrubs or anything. You're just letting things, you're just letting whatever's remnant or whatever is there and come up yeah i mean i'll do some of everything i mean and it's not a, a one size fits all hey plant this hey do this plant these trees or don't plant these trees. i mean i'll do everything and I, I mean i have a tree planter that i'll use for adding forest i mean i'll add screen with it um but then i'll do a lot of things with the chainsaw where you know it's it's opening up the canopy and all this new oh, regeneration yes and we, we looked through that earlier. I mean, all, all the different regeneration, all the forbs and the, and the different browse that's available for the deer, all, the, all the, the massive amounts of new food is just exponentially increased. And one of the facts you were saying uh, was that 200 pounds per acre. That's yeah. where I got my 10x. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was wrong. Yeah, I, wasn't for, trying to, for browse. I, I wasn't trying to soften all right. that. So, so roughly, here's just some loose figures. So if you have kind of an open open amount of timber there the roughly is about i mean a, a good a good uh starting point is to say there's roughly about 200 pounds 
of natural browse per acre on unmanaged timber. Managed correctly, you can get that tenfold. I mean, you can make that two, 3,000 pounds of natural browse and tonnage for the deer. So, and what we were talking about earlier is no matter what you plant for the deer, if you had an unlimited budget, unlimited machinery and ground to plant every blend of food plot known to man, um, a deer still only going to eat m- maybe 50% of that. 50% of their diet is going to be natural browse. Forbs, legumes, all the natural stuff around the woods. So if you're taking your woods and you start out with 200 pounds, and this is in any state pretty much. I mean, maybe you get to some monocultures in the north, and it's a little bit different. But in the Midwest, if, if, you, if you have 200 pounds of natural forage and, and browse per acre, and you can bring that to 2,000, 3,000 pounds, I mean, it's just good for everything. Mm-hmm. It's good for the bucks. It's good for the fawns. It's good for the does. It's going to attract more deer. It's going to hold more deer. They're going to be healthier. Um, it's, it's, it's better for everything. It's better for the whole ecosystem, really. I mean, a shaded out forest with no sunlight getting to the floor is not ideal for wildlife. I think most people understand that. So what I'll, what I do is, you know, I clearly open that up. I clearly manage for invasives, um, like we were looking at earlier. And then I'm constantly maybe, you know, every five years going back through there and checking it over again. Oh, I missed this. Or, Hey, I want to open this up a little bit further. Uh, and every five years I go kind of back through it. Mm -hmm. And a guy definitely wants to start out with like a state forester or a private forester or even get both because the, the state forester is going to be free. So they usually will come and visit your ground for free. And with forestry, there's so much, so many subjective parts that I would get a state forester and I would probably get a, maybe a private forester as well, or get a couple opinions or somebody who's done this a mm-hmm. lot, get them out, get a couple opinions because you're going to hear one forester tell you one thing. And it might be a state forester in this county tells you, Hey, I think you should do this talk to the state forester in that county and it's like your plan's totally opposite it's totally different than what this guy told me it's a little frightening it's it's bizarre i mean i've seen it i've i've worked with 10 different state foresters here and literally 10 different opinions on how things should be done so you're there is a little bit of subjectivity on taking your own approach your own spin to it as long as you have some education saying Mm -hmm. okay i got this opinion from this person this education, you know, this information and this from this and take a little bit from each and just don't make big mistakes and then, and then add your own spin to it. Where did you learn, where did you learn your spin? So I assume a lot of it through trial and error, but yeah, I mean, I was really careful. So the one thing I knew was my limitations when I started was, Hey, you know, when I had a private forester and a state forester showing me things when I was maybe, I think I was 21 or so. Um, They were going over, hey, do this, don't do that. And then I just got really cautious with like older growing things that were of higher value, like oaks and walnuts, stuff like that. Like I was like, I don't dare cut those things because I don't want to make a mistake. And I'd rather err on that side of caution than being like, ah, you know, that's a hundred year old white oak tree. Let's just hack it over to create a little more sunlight. Well, you're not putting that back together. So I was always starting out. I was very careful and that's something anybody can pick up. I mean, anybody can start there. Like don't go cutting hundred year old oak trees without really understanding that, without getting a couple more opinions on how do I deal with these oaks over here? Or how do I deal with these walnuts? Uh, cause that's not repairable. So, um, I was just very conservative. And then kind of what I teach people now is I'll say, Hey, here's a group of, you know, I'll look at, let's just say it's Illinois. And I'll say, these types of trees are in Illinois by where you're at. If you cut these five, you really can't make a mistake. If you're cutting an elm, if you're cutting an ash, if you're cutting a locust, stuff like that, you're, you're not really doing any major damage, even in the worst case. Mm-hmm. And then these are the trees we want to really watch out for and protect. Like if you see really nice walnuts, really nice oaks, white oaks. And, and I'll just, pre- uh, so I'll give kind of a kill list and a keep list. And it's at least a starting point. So if somebody says, hey, I just want to go through and, cut some trees down. Well, if you cut some locusts, you're not going to hurt anything. Uh, if you cut some elm trees, you're not going to hurt anything. And it's a little bit goal, um, goal oriented towards what do you want, you know? Um, and you know, if you want more brows, I mean, if, if you want more brows for the deer, if you were to cut a lot of elms down or a lot of ash and stuff like that and let it regenerate, I mean, there's really no mistakes that are going to come from that. I'm, I'm not going to say any, but very little mistakes and it's going to create a lot of new brows and a lot of new nutrition for the deer. Okay. And so someone's listening to this, they're probably like, well, do I girdle them? Do I fault? You know, do I chop the tree all the way down? Do I hinge them? That's where, I mean, beyond a state or private forester, is there any other resources 
because this is a whole i mean yeah this is a whole stack of stuff yeah you know, like we can't obviously get into all right of it, but like what what would you tell that person it's like okay i really need to go down this wormhole and start learning this because i'm i'm intrigued so yeah timber stand improvement and forestry management is it's a long long very very difficult subject so that's why if you've got a few experts they're going to speed this along and like what i'll do for some of my buddies is i'll come through and i'll just axe a bunch of trees that need to go and then past that um and really, so when you say get rid of like once again yeah. what, what does okay. that mean right so then it's it comes down to you know first safety listen hey i got a 20 inch tree on my farm i'm not real good with a chainsaw no don't go hacking down a 20 inch tree you're gonna drop it on yourself and kill yourself don't do that double girdle that um you know and then learning what trees if if, if a guy says hey i like hinge cutting okay hinge cutting's fine it gets overdone a lot. People go way overboard with it, or they they'll hinge twenty trees and think their ground is transformed. That's the other side of it too. So, but like hinge cutting, sure you can hinge cut. You got to know which trees hinge cut well, and again, that'll come pretty easily with talking to some people who know what they're doing. Like a shag bark hickory will hinge cut just fine. If you go and try and hinge a ash or a red oak, it's just it's going to explode. It's not going to hinge it well at all. So understanding which species hinge well and saying, okay, these species are what I have that hinge well. An elm will hinge reasonably well. A hackberry will hinge reasonably well. Um, I have these species that hinge well. What's too much hinging? Well, if you hinge every one of these trees, way too much. You know, deer aren't going to be able to get through there at all. But yeah, you know, every 10 tree, maybe you want to hinge that here and there where you might want a little more uh, break up in the cover. So that's, I would say the hinging is very subjective, but so safety would be number one. Um, hinging would be subjective on where you want the hinges for what reasons, which that's a whole nother can of worms. And there's a million videos on hinge cutting. All I'd say is hinge cutting can be overdone, drastically overdone. I didn't uh, see hardly any hinge on what we Yeah, I don't, I don't hinge a lot. I yeah. hinge in a few pockets here and there. And I like and it. So what a pocket is like an acre pocket? Or are we Less. talking like... Less. A visual pocket. Yes, I, yes. I want a, I want a small pocket. Maybe it's five trees, mm -hmm. and I just want a place where there's a backdrop. Maybe maybe some deer can bet against it. Maybe it's a breakup, so it's just a, a terrain change. Um, going and like hinge cutting ten solid acres. Of course, clearly, no, don't do that. Uh, one out of ten trees. If you were to hinge cut, that probably would be okay. Um, double girdling is a safety issue. Double. That's where double girdling comes into place is when you're like, hey, I don't want to be tipping over this great big tree. Uh, usually it does a pretty good job of killing the tree, at least below the girdles. Sometimes you got to come back. Um, and then just cutting a tree through, we talked about this When survey. you double girdle, sorry, do you, do you spray it as well? I don't. You just cut it? Yeah. It okay. depends on the tree. Now, if it's an invasive tree or if it's a tree that's really problematic, uh, I, will, I will spray that. Now, if you double girdle like an oak tree or something, you don't want to spray that because let's just say you're thinning out some oaks and those roots are grafted together. So mm. oak over here and an oak over here will share a root system. So if you put a herbicide in there, it'll go into the roots and the other tree can absorb that. So you could kill another tree. So that's why I'm just very careful with the herbicide. So double girdling will kill it below the double girdles done effectively. And then if you're in a reasonable deer density area, the regrowth will get killed by the deer. They'll kill that tree anyways. And if you want to go back later, that's why I would always come back five years later and check things out. If you want to hit it again, if you want to cut it again, you can. Um, and then topping off a tree, if it's, you know, if you can safely do it, like I was showing you earlier, that tree has a great big root system under the soil. And when it puts out those new shoots, those new shoots are just filled with nutrients. Instead of, instead of supporting a whole tree, now it's putting all of those nutrients into the stems. And so lots of studies out there that show it's, you know, the, the protein content of soybeans. I mean, high in calcium, potassium, phosphorus. So it's putting all those nutrients that used to go into the whole tree into these stems. And that's why the deer, what we were looking at earlier, the deer will just nip that and eat it down and eat it down and eat it down. And they kill the tree because they love eating it. Every mm -hmm. bud that comes off there, they just chew it down and eat it. And it's great nutrition for the deer and they kill the tree. Yeah. More sunlight, more browse. More opportunity for new growth, getting rid of junk. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Is there any reason people shouldn't cut their timber? Um, from a deer hunting perspective? From a deer hunting perspective, I would say I can't think of a whole lot. I mean, if it's <laughs> if it's sparse uh, and there's a lot of wide open 
uh, canopy as it is, and it's just a very low density stand, which I really can't think of very many situations like this. Maybe, maybe not then, but yeah, it would just be like personal preference. Like, yeah, I want a park, mm-hmm. which I don't want to park, and I'm not advising people. So I would say no. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess a few instances, um, if it was just a very low density, uh, and there was plenty of sunlight getting to the fourth floor, and for whatever reason, there wasn't a lot of trees, then, then you wouldn't cut. Mm-hmm. And so you mentioned this earlier, good timber beats all. Yeah. You think? Yeah. You're I a mean, little more hesitant on that now. Yeah. <laughs> now that so, it up again. <laughs> so, you know, you get up to um, north of Iowa, you get into Minnesota, sure. especially in the northern parts, and it gets to be very low quality timber, and it gets to be more monoculture where you're like, hey, up in um, Wisconsin, Minnesota, northern michigan the the amount of diversity goes way down so you gotta you gotta handle this different now in the midwest like iowa missouri indiana ohio there's a lot of diversity out here so you i would always focus on retaining your highest value trees there's not a ton of them i mean there might be two or three per acre well your forest can can um support hundreds of trees per acre so if you're allowing two or three very, very high quality trees to stay there, you can do whatever you want with still 90% of the ground while retaining your high quality trees. Mm -hmm. And maybe your walnut's not producing benefits to the whitetails really, but I mean, the value of a walnut is astronomical. So you'd be crazy to wipe out your walnuts and it's only taking up a very small amount of the area really if you're you're keeping your veneer walnuts. A lot of them don't seem to have a ginormous canopy like a ginormous old oak and a cat like you've seen yeah. that cattle pasture oak that's yep. ginormous yeah so those are those are wolf oaks and usually those will grow up in the open and they'll just have branches everywhere and those white oaks especially like the white oak some of those trees will be two or three hundred years old and a walnut's not going to grow to that age or a red oak or you know a black oak stuff like that but a, a white oak a bur oak i mean those will get several hundred years old and they're throwing out acorns every year i mean is acorn the game changer for deer no they're coming down in September and October for a short time, every few years on a white oak. Uh, it's not a huge game changer, but they're also creating um, oak regeneration, which the deer are browsing on. Um, I personally just like oak. I think it's good for the ecosystem. I think it's good for other wildlife. So there's all sorts of other benefits to oak. Somebody says, is it, is it the most desirable whitetail tree? No. No, for just hunting whitetails, no. But you need it as a component of your forest. You sure. need it. What do you think is the most desirable whitetail tree? Mm. Or is it? And when I'm when I'm framing all these questions too, I'm picturing like that belt that we're talking about. Like, I mean, I would say oak actually. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> contradict myself a little bit here, but oak is a, a quite a beneficial. It's a beneficial tree to the ecosystem because it's creating browse, it's creating um, mass production. Um, and it's creating uh, a system where where all the other wildlife can benefit from. I guess that's not that's not white tails, but but otherwise, I would say um, trees that are growing as young trees that deer want to browse on. So like you know, ash or whatever. I mean, there's a whole host of trees that deer like to browse on as young trees. That would be in the and that's just a long list. So yeah. technically speaking, um, some of your softwoods that the deer like browsing on when they're young would probably be the most benefit to a whitetail. And then also some that created uh, maybe some dense cover for bedding and stuff like that, which, you know, so they all kind of have their place. I mean, I kind of like the definition of a forest or a timber. Yeah. Like there's multiple. Yeah. You got to Diversity is just so, I mean, it's cliche. People say diversity all the time and, and, but you need it. You really do need it. Um, I don't go plant anything. Uh, for food plots or for a crop or for for trees that's just like hey i just chose this one or these three things no it's 10 things Mm -hmm. it's 10 things for crp for native grasses for forbs it's 10 things for food plots i want 10 10 20 different tree plantings or trees or shrubs i mean diversity is just huge i mean then you can go well what's better trees or shrubs and then then they all have their place Mm -hmm. so Anybody that tries to say there's just this one thing would be, in my opinion, incorrect. When we were looking at some of your food plots, too, you said there's, you pair three things together typically, right? Is that what you said? Yeah. So a grain. Yep. Corn and bean. Yep. 
some sort of green. Yep. And was there was it just two? Yeah. But obviously, so, once again. So I like having a grain, and then I'll have clover next to it, and then so on Iowa whitetail, we'll have uh, there's a guy called Double Tree on there, and he had a double tree rotation. And without the grain, what he did is he had brassicas in one half, and he had a rye mix, a cereal rye mix in the other half. And you can rotate those back and forth each year. And that, it's just like a corn and bean rotation. Mm-hmm. It's good for disease, for uh, how the nutrients are utilized through the soil. One eats nitrogen, one scavenges and fixes nitrogen. Like the legumes will fix nitrogen, the rye will scavenge for it. So, And you just flip-flop those, so, which reduces on your fertilizer cost. So by having three things, so I'll have a grain, then I'll have clover, then I'll have brassicas. And then within that clover, I'll clean that clover up. I'll mow it, I'll spray it with clethodim, and then I just run through. And I know not everybody can do this. I understand that. But I'll run through that with a no-till drill, and I'll put like winter rye, um, oats, peas, radish. If if the clover's in rough shape, I might add more clover. Sometimes I have alfalfa, but I'll run that drill through there. And then my clover becomes not just clover. Now it becomes a late season draw big time because it has the winter rye, which is staying green all the way into the winter. It'll have other things in it, the winter peas. Um, and then it's also uh, improving the soil. So mm-hmm. rye is an excellent soil, soil builder. Um, and then next spring, you know, it's going to put on a lot of biomass with the rye, improve the soil, decompose. Um, there's just a whole lot of benefits to it. So I like having like three things roughly in a food plot just because let's just say I was muzzleloader hunting and I want to go out and see some does or bring a kid with me and we'll shoot some does. And somebody down the road might have just beans and like, Hey, but it's a, it's a really warm evening. Mm -hmm. They're not coming to the beans. Well, I can hunt on a bean field, but next to the beans, there's clover with my Rimex drilled into it. And next to that, there's brassica. So it's a warm evening. Hey, they might not be coming to the beans that evening, but now they're coming to the, the clover or the rye or Maybe they're coming to the brassica. So all my plots, no matter what the weather is, I know they're going to come there. And I'm, I, I really don't shoot a lot of deer um, off of food plots, but late in the season one, I want to hold them. Mm-hmm. I want to keep them safe. And that's when I bring out kids, friends, stuff like that. We'll do our doe, doe management, bully bucks. We'll hunt for some old bucks, stuff like that. Um, and I, you know, back in the day, I would just put maybe just beans there. And a lot of times I'd get frustrated because the weather wasn't right and they wouldn't come to it. Mm-hmm. I can think of a lot of late season where it can be pretty mild for a while. Absolutely. And then it's like, man, well, these beans are supposed to be awesome. Yeah. Late season. <laughs> and then there's still things you can do with your beans, even if you're like, hey, I don't want to, I don't want to take other ground to add these other things. You could still overseed your beans, especially if Definitely. you planted them on time and they start to yellow. You can put, you know, winter rye across there, different things you could interseed it in there. So you got multiple food sources within those beans too. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. Mm-hmm. I think we we covered a lot, and I think I think a lot after this. So I guess I'm trying to say what's going on here. Uh, it's kind of Pandora's box continues. The the more you learn, the more you see other people's farms and how they do things. Yep. The more I'm leaving with more questions, and obviously than what I came with, uh, which is exciting. Yep. So I would say for someone that has some of these same thoughts where should they go and check some things out i know you mentioned iowa whitetail as a forum um would that be the place to yeah to start always yeah picking away so that's one place um there's probably 20 guys on there that really know what they're doing that truly can get results wherever they go so that's 20 different minds that if you post a question, you'll get an honest answer. Mm-hmm. If I go somewhere where it's like, hey, they're trying to sell me this, they're trying to sell me that, it's kind of a crapshoot. And then, and then you have how many hundreds of deer experts that aren't deer experts that you shouldn't be taking their advice. So that's just hard to sift through that stuff. So, um, you know, I don't think anybody should take advice from one place or one person. I think you got to, and then, and still, you, even if I take advice from, 10 different people, I'm still going to try it and be like, whoa, that didn't work out well, or that did work out well, or hey, that was pretty good advice, and then I made my own spin and made it work for me. So mm-hmm. um, I don't think there's any any easy button there. For sure. Well, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate uh, getting the, the tour, getting to see some of the projects that, you've, that you do and implement, have some more conversations to hash out here. But um, if you want to plug whatever you want. Sure. I mean, Iowa Whitetail is uh, kind of the baby I took on. Um, 
just, I mean, that's where I learned a lot of what I learned. There was my good friend, Double Tree, who ended up being a neighbor to me on my very first farm. Um, and we did a lot of projects together, and he was constantly posting Iowa Whitetail. And I was just constantly just eating this information up, which is still there. And it just helped me so much. Uh, and, and even within that time, I mean, things have changed. I've learned a lot. That, you know, what I would have recommended to somebody 10 years ago I might have quite a bit different um, ways I go about it now. I mean, the way I fertilized things 10 years ago, the way I worked the soil 10 years ago compared to now, um, how I use the crops or use what I plant to save me money or time or to hassle or, or how I spray. I mean, that's different 10 years from now. But, you know, I would imagine that 10 years from now, I'll be doing things a lot different than I am today. So it's not like plants or white tails are changing that much it's just you just this the learning never quits and you're just constantly learning new tactics new things to save you time money effort things that are more successful than others there's constantly people testing things all the time so the white tail world it, you would think it would be very constant and very simple but there's all sorts of things that are changing all the time whether it's herbicides or um how what people are planning or uh, how to save money or, I mean, the equipment you use. It's just, it's constantly changing, which I like. And that's kind of what I like about the sport too. I mean, you know, the learning will never end on this stuff. No one's ever going to be a guru or an expert where like, I have every bit of this sport <laughs> figured out. I mean, far from it, far from it. There we have it. Well, thank you. And uh, look forward to diving in some more topics. Sounds good.